Amen. Thank you, our worship team. They do a great job every Sunday, don't they? So thank you for that. If you will, we're going we're gonna to be in a few places today, but we're going to start our, our base verses this morning. It's going to be in Romans, the 11th chapter, the 33, 33rd through the 36th verse. So if you want to find that right quick, you go right ahead. Uh, let me just do a public service announcement. If you want to work out and exercise, but you don't want to pay a subscription or a membership to anything, you can get here about 8 o'clock on Sunday mornings. And uh, Corbin Goss has his own gym in here, and uh, he'll have a bouncy ball and them super balls that bounces everywhere, and he has a hacky sack. And uh, he'll chase you with it, and he'll run you around and make you get down on your hands and knees, crawl around. So just a public service announcement. He has a ministry here and that he's doing on Sunday morning, so feel free to, to help him out this morning. I thought two minutes in, I'm like, I'm sweating. i got to stop this. I'm, I'm going to have to go change clothes or something. This guy's killing me. So, But you, you know what? I, I, I love that, and probably there are some churches that would frown upon that running around and playing with a kid in the church. But I'm going to tell you what, a church with no kids is a dying church. And so we need to embrace that. It's a, it's a blast to, to hang out. Now, he may come and do this at you. He may be Spider-Man this week. And then he may instantly, if you do it back into it, turn around, I'm Hulk man, and do that to you, and then and push you away. So you have to play along and be ready to... Uh, to be any character he decides you're going to be or that you're not going to be. So let's look. I, I tell you what we're going to get into uh, starting today, and, and we're going to cover this over the next several weeks. And this summer we're going to cover one of the doctrines of the church. And we're going to look at this summer, we're going to look at God the Father and who he is and getting to know him better. So let's read our, our uh, main text this morning from the 11th chapter of Romans, the 33rd through the 36th verse. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for this text. Thank you for this word that you have written for us, God. We love you. We want to get to know you better, God. And we know that if we search for you, you'll reveal yourself to us. And in the end, we benefit the most. God, we love you so much. In Jesus' name. Amen. Over the next several weeks, like I said, we're going to be looking at God the Father and that doctrine of the church. And, and what I want you to know is, is we're going to, like I said, we're going to be covering this for several weeks, but at the end of it, when we finish, we're still not going to completely know or understand God. And here's the reason. It's, it's not, it's not it, it, we can't. Let's just put it that way. We can't. We cannot fathom everything about God. When there are words to never describe him or sufficient words to, uh, to describe him, but also it's just a, an eternity of knowledge. And getting to know God is an ongoing thing, as I'll show you here in a few moments. So at the end of this, this is not comprehensive because there's no way to comprehensively understand God. Here, here's a quote that uh, Charles Spurgeon used, and Spurgeon being one of the great preachers of all times. And here's a quote that he had to his church. Let me read it to you. I believe that the proper study of God's elect is God. The proper study of a Christian is the Godhead. The highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy, which can never engage the attention of a child of God, is the name, the nature, the person, the work, the doings, and the existence of the great God whom, call, whom he calls his Father. We need to get to know God. And there is no, you're going to find out, probably one of the most meaningful or most important quest of our life as a Christian is gaining knowledge of God and getting to know him. So we're going to look at that today. And, and knowledge, knowledge is more 
it, it's more than just awareness of God. You can come into any church and you can say, okay, I know there's a God. You can be at work. Yes, there's a God. I believe in God. And that's just an awareness that there is God. It's almost like standing outside in front of the Biltmore Castle and saying, oh, yeah, it's a house. That is, just, that is just knowing that there it is. I have an awareness that this is a house, but I don't, underst- I don't understand the greatness of that house. The same thing with God. I can have an awareness of him and just know, yeah, there's God. Yeah, whatever. And I can move on. It is so much more than awareness. It's more than information. I, in the song there, uh, it talks about my world revolving around you. That is more than just information about God. Yeah, I can have information. I can, I can pick up a Bible at McKay's. Matter of fact, you can grab a Bible right here in the, in the chairs in front of you. If you wanted one, you don't have one, you could take one. Just having that book, just basically without knowing God, just kind of gives you some information, and that's the way you'll look at it. And we shouldn't treat God. Uh, it's more than awareness. It's more than information. And lastly, it's a lot more than religion, a lot more than religion. It is relational. It is knowing God, getting to know him better as much as we possibly can, knowing who our Father is. The first thing in getting to know God, is it's, the first thing we need to know is it's a meaningful quest, a meaningful quest. Let me read to you from Jeremiah, Jeremiah, the ninth chapter, the 23rd and 24th verse says this right here. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boast, boast in this. Don't, don't miss this. Let him boast in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in all these things I delight, declares the Lord. It is a meaningful quest. God desires for us to know him. We want to get to know him and know him as best we can. It's like getting when you meet new friends and you start, well, let's go one step further. You never just look at somebody and, uh, well, I'm sure there's been some people do this, but just look and say, I think I'll marry you today. It doesn't work that way. You got to get to know each other. You got to get to know each other very well. Now, there may be somebody sitting in here who said, that's the way my marriage worked, and I've been married 70 years, and congratulations, but not, not, not us normal people. That's not the way we did it. Is that the way you, you did it? No, no, I was going to say, Rachel shaking her, no. Uh-uh. So you got to get to know each other. And that's what God desires from us is to have a meaningful seeking of his knowledge and getting to know him. It's kind of like this guy. He goes out to this farm to see this farmer, and he looks over while he's waiting on him. He looks on the side of the barn, and there are these bullseyes painted on the side of the barn. And he walks over, what is this about? And he walks over, and right in the center I mean absolute perfect center of every bullseye was a hole that had been shot into that barn wall. So when the farmer comes over, the guy says, hey, first thing I want to ask you. He said, this is the most impressive thing I've ever seen. You shot a bullseye every single time. And the farmer says, well, it's a little more to it than that. He said, you see, what I did was I shot the wall and then I painted the bullseye. (laughs) And you know what it did is it gave that guy visiting the farmer, it gave the impression that he was a marksman. It gave an impression that he knew what he was doing with a handgun or, or a gun, but in reality, he didn't know anything. He knew how to shoot a gun, but that was about it. And that's the way it is when we don't understand God and we don't strive to get to know him. We give the presentation to people that we know God and when the the bottom line is we are absolutely ignorant of God. And when we are ignorant of God, it's not God's fault. 
It's our fault because he longs to give us knowledge and give us wisdom if we'll seek after that. The next thing is it's an authentic quest. You heard us talk about authenticity earlier uh, when we were, I was talking to John, but it's an authentic uh, quest. John, if I flip back to John, the, the 17th chapter, Jesus is praying here. And, and the, to me, what I think is one of the coolest things about this prayer, Jesus, in his life on earth, in this section of verses, Jesus is praying for us, us, people sitting here today in this prayer. But in John, the 17th chapter, the first through the third verse, listen to this. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son, that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. It is an authentic quest to get to know God. It is not about quantity. It's not about years on this earth, but it's about quality of life. And how do I find quality of life? When I get to know God, when I finally come into the realization and the knowledge of who God is, a result of me knowing God is quality of life found in eternal life. That is the only place we find quality, is in knowing that we have settled peace and knowledge that we are going to heaven, that we will have eternity forever, infinity, and beyond. Some of y'all caught that quote, and some of you didn't. You got, some, you got some Disney Pixar homework to do. But it goes on and on forever. That is quality of life, and it is found in knowing him. Jesus is saying, what Jesus is saying here is don't just seek life. Don't just seek life, but seek knowledge of God. Seek after knowledge of the Father, and that leads to eternal life. My One of my favorite, if not the favorite verse I have in the Bible is John 10.10, 10, just a few chapters before that, where Jesus says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come to give life and give it more abundantly. That is quality. Jesus is saying, hey, I'm here, the thief. Who is the thief? The thief is Satan. And what is he here? He's here to destroy us. He is here to destroy the church. He is here to destroy your life and your walk with Jesus. But Jesus says, that's what his job is. But here's why I came. I came here to give you life. And not just normal, everyday life. Church. As Christians, that's why I love to laugh because Jesus says, I came to give it more abundantly. I ought to laugh harder than anybody else because I know I have a knowledge of God. I ought to cry harder than anybody else because of my knowledge of God. I ought to love harder than anybody else because of my knowledge of God. It's abundance that Jesus has given us. It's not a whole hum life being a Christian. It's not an easy life. By no means is it easy. I'll be the first one to tell you that. I've looked from cover to cover. I looked in the maps. I looked in, the, in every part of my Bible, and I would encourage you to do the same thing and find that verse that Jesus said, thou shalt have an easy life when you follow me. Matter of fact, he says it's difficult. It's hard. It's not even people are going to hate you. He says people hated me, and they're surely going to hate you. And dislike you, it's an authentic life. And out of that authenticity comes truth. Now, a lot of times we don't like the truth. We don't. The word of God, though, is true. Every word. Jesus said there in his, in his prayer, there in, in John 17, if you, if you move over to the 17th verse, Jesus says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is the truth. He is saying, Jesus, sanctify, set them apart. Set them apart in your truth. 
Knowledge of God gives me true knowledge, the truth that I can depend on. His word is true. I don't understand it all, all the time. I don't. But I can stand on it that I know that it's true because God is true and he said it's true. And I just have to believe it. That's all I got to do is just believe it. And here's why we don't normally like the truth. Because if when we tell the truth or when somebody tells us the truth, a lot of times we don't like it. Here's a tough question. Does this make me look, husbands and wives, does this make me look a certain way? And then you pause. What is the right answer I need to give right here? Because sometimes the truth can be hurtful. Sometimes the truth can make you mad. Sometimes the truth is going to cause people to not like you. It may cost you some friends. If we saw in that song, what did it say? Things cost. Following Christ cost us something. It can cost you as much as your life. You see it in the Bible. You see it, what John was talking about earlier in India. Following Christ can cost you your life. It is a costly venture to follow Jesus. But here's the thing with God. God's going to tell you the truth every time. Every single time. Let me tell you what it is. It is not like kumbaya with Jesus. It is not like that. He's going to tell you the truth right up front. There's, God's not going to look at you and say, here, here's a trophy. You did your best, but you did your best part of sinning there. But you know what? We just got to glaze over that and just love people. God says, I love you, but here's the truth for you. And that can be painful sometimes. I know when people, when mentors of mine, preachers have leaned into me at times and given me a truth about something that revealed something that I needed to deal with, it was uncomfortable. It was downright hurtful. And sometimes even led to tears. But in the end, the truth always wins. And God will always be truthful with you. Because Jesus will go just, I mean, he'll go one step further and he'll tell you what Ephesians 1, uh, second chapter, the first and second verse says, you were dead in your sins when you walked with the world. That's some hard truth. If God comes by, when the Holy Spirit starts working on you and you realize I am dead in my sins, I am dead, some of your texts may say transgressions. I was dead. Look, you are dead in your sins. I remember that at a little altar in Hughley, Alabama. When God's told me that day, you are dead in your sins, I had to get to that altar. I couldn't wait till we got to the invitation. Come on, preacher, get there, because I got to get down there. Let me tell you, don't you ever let that stop you. Johnny sits back there next to the door. John's right there in that corner. You need to find Jesus, and I'm preaching it. I'll stop it, or you can go back there, and we'll do it right then. We'll get that settled up. But God will tell you the truth. Here's the downside to that. There is a downside to it. There's a downside as our knowledge of God grows. Here's the downside. He reveals himself. Then guess what happens? He reveals who we are. My knowledge of God grows, and he starts revealing himself to me, and then all of a sudden, he reveals to Marty who Marty is. He re will reveal to you who you are. And sometimes we're like Peter in Luke, the, the fifth chapter and the eighth verse. And that's when Jesus is calling his first disciples. And we, we find ourselves to be like Peter. They'd been out fishing all night long. Hadn't caught a thing. And here they are. They're cleaning their nest, getting ready to go in for the day. And Jesus, big crowds followed Jesus to hear him preach. So he gets out and says, hey, let's get out in this boat. And he gets out a little ways so that he can preach to the crowds. Finally, he looks at Peter and he says, Peter, hey, uh, throw the nets out. And Peter's response, oh, come on, God. Come on, Jesus. So we've been out here all night long and haven't caught anything. He says, just cast it out. Just throw your nets out. And he said, because it's you, I'll do it. Now, I don't, I'm sure Peter and all those guys are tired. They're, they just started cleaning everything. And now you're telling me to fish. Okay. Y'all know how they threw it. Like a 14-year-old, 
Mm. Probably did it that way. I don't want to do it, but I'll do it because it's you. And he threw it out there. And what happens? The nets get so loaded with fish that they start tearing, and they call for help from their partners to come over and help them. And the fish is an incredible amount of fish. And that's when Peter has the knowledge of who Jesus is. And what does Jesus, what does Peter say there? He falls down on his knees and he says, oh, woe is me. They got back in and every, Jesus says, follow me. And everyone just left. Those guys he called just left, left their stuff, their nets, everything, and followed Jesus because they came into a truthful God himself through his son Jesus, one in the same, revealed to them who he is. And we find ourselves being like Peter sometimes. When the knowledge hits you, it's like running into a brick wall or a transfer truck running over you. Like, wow, I didn't see that coming, and there it is. God's authentic, and he reveals himself, and he reveals the truth of in the authentic you and who you really are. God will also reveal what the world is and who the world is and what the workings of the world are. It will also reveal to us, God will, through knowledge in him, will reveal to us the true meaning of society's rules. He will provide that knowledge. And when we understand that and we see what's going on and we see it through the eyes of God and through his knowledge, we see what's going on, then we understand it better. It's kind of like hot dogs or sausage. Don't you love them? Oh, I love a good hot dog. I love sausage, especially homemade sausage. When I was a kid growing up, my granddad, they always killed hogs. He always had hogs, and we killed them. They're in the backyard. So I saw it from oink to the plate. We love it but we don't necessarily want to see how it's made. If you see how it's made, I've heard guys uh, in my job, I treat guys who retired uh, from Lay's Packing downtown. They talk, I said, they say, it's so good, but you don't want to see it being made. And I think that's the way it is. We like the end result of our knowledge of God, but we don't like, and we don't want to see the process of it. We don't want to put the work in of it. We don't want to see the ugliness of it. Hey, God, don't make me do anything. Just here, just grant me the knowledge. Reveal yourself to me. And that's not the way it works. The next thing is it's a beneficial quest. A beneficial quest. How does it benefit me? Nothing benefits our day-to-day -day life than the knowledge of God. And let me tell you, God wants to impart life application knowledge to us. Because learning and knowing God will reveal, to thing, uh, reveal things to us that will help us live our lives better, a more abundant life. When we take over our own lives, that's when it becomes less abundant. But when I follow the knowledge of God and get to know him, my life becomes more abundant. And people start seeing that in me. When you look at day, uh, Daniel, when he was in Babylonia and he was captured there and mistreated and things like this, this is what he said in, in, in Daniel, the 11th chapter, the 32nd verse. He says, but the people who know their Lord will stand firm and take action. If I just, whenever, I'm telling you, turn your news off, turn your TVs off, turn your radios off. And the time that you would sit and hear that horribleness of what's going on in the world, spend that time with God in getting to know him. And he will reveal proper life application knowledge of what's going on in the world and how we as Christians should respond. You know, I stopped watching the news in October of 2016, greatest thing I've ever done. I think I've maybe watched two news services, one local, one national, since that time period. You don't know how knowledge is. Go read about it. Do whatever you do. But spend more time. My knowledge of God is more important than my knowledge of what the media tells me. God will tell me how to live my life and how to apply his knowledge to my life. With that, and if you look at Daniel, Daniel had a confidence there. 
Knowing God and why we need to know and understand God the Father will also give us confidence in our daily life. Daniel, in the trouble he was in and the things he faced, still had confidence in his God that he's going to deliver, that he's going to take care of things, and it will do the same thing for us. Everybody wants to fix things. Everybody wants to do things and change things. The problem is a lot of times we don't know the right way to do it. But God will give us the knowledge as Christians to do the change things, fix things, but also do it the right way. And again, that's a truthful way, and doing it God's way can be unpopular. Same thing can be said in the church. When God says, okay, Arlington, I need you. I want you. This is my goal for you. I want you to do that. Well, but you need to listen here, God, because we've always done it this way. That is the famous last words of a dead church. Well, we've always done it this way. God's going to cause us to change course sometimes and, and, and stay focused on him, but change what we're doing, but he will also provide us the knowledge of how to do it so that we get it right. Another thing is it gives security. Knowledge of God gives security. If I flip over to Psalms, the 46th Psalm, the first through the first, third verse, listen to this. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Look, I have security in my knowledge and my relationship with Jesus. I have that security. It says, even though the mountains may crumble, earthquakes, earthquakes may come, the waters may be just tearing it up and foaming over and the waves are huge and it seems like my life is falling apart and it's all closing in on me, I have a clear and present help, and that is Jesus Christ. He'll take care of all that stuff. Just stay focused on him, and his knowledge will keep you in the right place at the right time and how to respond and how to uh, live your life. So it gives security, and then it gives wisdom. Knowing God gives wisdom. If I flip over to uh, or, or Ephesians 17, Paul says this when he's praying. He said that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. God wants to get to know us. And God wants us to have life. He wants to give us life. He wants to give us that life application knowledge. Tony Evans, one of my favorite uh, preachers, Tony Evans says this. I'm going to quote, quote him. Wisdom is to truth as, shoe, as a shoe is to shoe leather. You have to stop and think about that just a minute. You can hand me a piece of leather. I have no clue how to make a shoe out of it. But a shoe is pertinent to that leather. But when I have the wisdom of what to do with that piece of leather, I can make a shoe with it. When God imparts his wisdom and we take on that wisdom and we follow it, God will provide avenues for us to do things that are beyond us. He will give us the wisdom to do those things. And then the next thing, it gives order to our lives. Getting to know God will bring some order to our lives. If I look at 2 Peter, 2 Peter, uh, the first chapter, the second and third verse, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. It will bring order to your life. Knowledge of God will bring order to our everyday life. It's like when my eight grandkids come to my house. This is kind of what order with that looks like. And this is what it sounds like in 15 seconds. Would you put your shoes, go brush your teeth. Why are you naked? Why do you have rocks up your nose? I told you to put your shoes, put them on the right foot. No, they're not on the right foot. Get in there and get ready to go. Have you eaten? Yes. Why are you sticking pancakes in your ears? Look, Cricket just 
cook that for you. Why is it not? I know you want yogurt, but here's your food. Eat your food. Why are you doing that? I told you to put your shoes on. Get your teeth brushed. It's time to go. It's total chaos. Now, knowledge as a parent. Jennifer, why did we have children? <laughs> but my knowledge tells me that at the end of the day, it's okay. Those kids are going to get where they need to be. We're going to get them fed. We're going to get them clothed eventually. They're going to stop using the bathroom in my front yard. <laughs> Mark in his territory. But my knowledge as an experienced parent, I know what's important and what's not. I know what hill is worth dying on. But when I come into the knowledge of God, I know which hill was died on. I know which hill Jesus died on, Calvary. And my knowledge of him will bring order to my life like never before. And when we, God brings order to our lives, what we need to understand is that order may change things for us. It may change the locations that you hang out. It may change the friends or so-called friends that you have. It will change the way you talk. It'll change the way you walk. But it will give order to my life. If I flip over to Colossians, Colossians, the first chapter, the ninth and tenth verse says this, And so, from the day we heard, and this is Paul, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You see Paul, and you hear Paul say this so many times about knowledge. We pray that you'll receive knowledge. We need to seek after the knowledge of God. That is why we are going to spend the next several weeks studying who God the Father is. It is so important to have that knowledge. If you read that scripture there in, in, in Colossians, it, it talks about uh, a, a kind of a fruit. And here's the two things, every, two characteristics that every fruit has. Number one, it resembles and it's a reflection of the tree. Every piece of fruit. As a follower of Christ, I am a reflection of Jesus. He is the tree, I am the fruit. But here's the other thing about fruit. Fruit, trees, do not bear the fruit for fruit purpose. For their own purpose. Fruit is produced for everybody else. It is produced, fruit grows, and when it's ripe and ready to go, what is it for? For me to eat, animals to eat. It is for somebody else to take part of. Look, when we have wisdom of God, we reflect our Father. And when we have wisdom of God, our fruits start producing, and people start seeing the fruits. And maybe your fruit is teaching. People come to your teaching in a, in a small group, men's group, women's group, Bible study back here. They come to that, and they start partaking of the fruit that you have. People start seeing our fruits and say, there's something different about them. There's something different about their life. I want some of what they've got. And they see our fruits and they take of our fruits and maybe they wind up here or they wind up in a small group that you lead and you, we get to point them to Jesus. But our fruit is our, um, first and foremost are to bring glory to God, but it's for other people. It's not for us to say, hey, look at me. It's for us to share with other people. It's a challenging quest. Romans the... We go back to our, our main text, Romans 11th chapter, 33rd through the 36th verse, a challenging quest. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable his ways. For who 
has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Verse 33 there, when I look back at that verse, verse 33 says, getting to know God never ends. You never graduate. You never, there's no amount of Sunday school classes, Bible studies, small groups that you can go to that you finally say, I know everything about God. If you ever have a teacher in this church Look at you at the end of a session and say, therefore now you know everything about God. Please come tell me. Because it says there, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. It's just completely, it's kind of looking at the Milky Way. I just saw a thing this week, Milky Way. If you traveled from one side of the Milky Way to the other at light speed, traveling the speed of light, take you 100,000 years. I kind of feel like understanding God's that way. When I look at what, you know, and, I, and, I, and I'll say it again, science is proving what the Bible has always said. And all of a sudden, people are shocked. There's these stars out here. There's these other galaxies. That's just my God doing his thing. That's just God saying, I'm going to put this over here. I'm going to put this star here. Here's your name, star. Scripture says that. He names them. He knows them by their names. But understanding God can change our lives. It's like somebody, here's what I say when I, I perform a wedding service. The first thing, one of the first things I say to them right there in front of the church is, you might think you love this person right now. You might think, oh, I'm so in love. And you are, I hope you are, you're getting married. But you might think you love them. I thought I loved Jennifer when she said I do and I said I do. I just thought I loved her. But you come 34 years down the road here, I look just crazy. I didn't think I could love this woman anymore than I do. The same thing for you. You just think you'd love that person, but you get down the road. And in that, when you get down the road, you'll find out you learn new things about them. I've been married 34 years. There's still things every now and pops up. And I'm like, what? Hurt my feelings. I love vegetable soup. She told me about two years ago, you know, I don't like vegetable soup. I'm like, what? But we learn new things. Same thing with God. I don't care how long you're, you've been in relationship with him. You're going to learn new things. I can take his word. I can read this section we just read. I can come back six months from now when God brings me back here, and I'm going to read that, and I guarantee I'm going to find something different. And I'm going to understand something different because my knowledge is growing, and because when I seek after it, God reveals it to me. And then it pops out. I'm like, really? That's there? I have never seen that before. And finally, it's a quest of priority. It's a quest of priority. And whose priority is it? Ours. It should be. As a Christian, our priority should be getting to know God. Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, the 29th verse says to search with all your heart. Search with all your heart. Search like, man, There's this is the lost hidden prize. Because ultimately, it is. The prize that offers eternal life. Proverbs, the second chapter, fourth verse says that wisdom is like seeking silver. And I think John said this a couple of weeks ago. And where is silver? It's in the ground. How have you got to get it? Dig. Church, here's my challenge to you this week and for the days to come dig 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 get to know God 
And over the coming weeks, we're going to teach about that and preach about that. But this is why we got to study about God and understand Him and understand His Word. So these coming weeks, church, I'm going to ask you, dig. I'm not going to ask Him to tell you, dig. Get into the Word. You know, we can come into church and I can get an acquaintance with God. I can get all the information. And if you come in and a church has good music, and we do, you can feel the presence of God. But the sad thing about that is a lot of times people will come into the church and they get those three things and then when they walk out the door, they never let God rub off on them and to start a relationship with them. They were just cool with the acquaintance, just cool with the information, and just cool with the religion part of it. But God is calling us to know him personally. And when we know him personally, it's eternal life. It's life forever, the way he designed it, in relationship with him. And when we pass, and we all will, it's to go to heaven, to live with him forever, to where the knowledge, I think, really kicks in then. It's going to be incredible. Won't you come go on that journey? Won't you come into relationship with him this morning? Johnny will be down here. John's back in the corner. I'll be at the back. Won't you come to know Jesus this morning? Won't you stand? And won't you come? God, we pray that if there's anyone here who needs to know you, today is the day. God, don't let us leave here with just an acquaintance with you with just some information about you, with just some religious understanding. But God, we all leave here as one of your family members. We love you so much. 